This text was written by Lama Tsongkhapa, who many of you know is one of our kind of heart scholars. And there's been a beautiful translation into Hebrew as well, which might get, make it easier for your study. So the text that we're using is like the pith. It's the main points of the whole Dharma path. And I think it makes it really useful for organizing your mind to understand what do my priorities need to be in terms of study and in terms of practice. Then you can go to a million different teachings and not get kind of overwhelmed with content. You know, sometimes you can be going to this teaching and that teaching and how does it all fit together and where do I start? But if you can keep coming back to the three principal aspects of the path, you'll stay organized and your practice will stay really powerful and not go off onto weird tangents. And then all of the other things you learn beautifully plug into the three principal aspects of the path. So it's like everything is contained there, but it keeps it simple enough that you can have good forward momentum. So I'll just explain for like 20 minutes. That's it, half hour max. And then I'm gonna open it up for group discussion so that you can all talk together at full speed in Hebrew about how do we actually take these teachings into our life. And then we'll have a little break and then I'll lead a meditation. And next week then it will be student led, but I'll be supporting the students with um, structures and outlines so that it's really accurate. So that's what we'll do. And I, I think that it could really work out well. Um, it's yours to decide. So I'll um, help us set our motivation by using refuge in bodhicitta. So just take a minute, ground yourself, settle into your space, settle into your body. And connect with the meaning of these words. Sangge chudon sogi chunam la John chu padu dani capsu chi Dagi chun yan gi pe sonam gi Roll up and cheer sangge drupal show Sangge chudon sogi chunam la John chu padu dani capsu chi Dagi chun yan gi pe sonam ki Drola penjia sangge drupa sho Sangge chudon sogi chunam la Jan chupadu dane kapsu chi Dagi chun yan gi pe sonam ki Drola penjia sangge drupa sho and letting the motivation sink in. Okay, so the three principal aspects of the path by Lama Zopa, I'll be using the English translation by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and there's the Hebrew translation information there as well. I hope I pasted the right part. Um, give me uh, Hebrew connections and corrections afterwards if I made any mistakes. Um, the main sources that I really recommend you look at outside of class, if you're really interested, is Cutting Through Appearances by Geshe Lundrup Zopa and An Offering Cloud of Nectar by His, Holy, by, by his Eminence Chudin Rinpoche. So these two texts have so much information about this prayer. And it's really um, traditionally presented, but very accessible at the same time. So I'll come back to that um, 
or I'll remind you of that again later, but um, just so in the back of your mind, you know, these are two really good follow-up resources. So the three principal aspects of the path was expounded by Venerable Manjushri, and it possesses the three preliminary parts of a treatise. So you'll see this pattern again and again, where there's an expression of homage at the beginning of the composition. There's a pledge or a promise to compose. And then there's a part urging the disciples, the students to listen. So all the traditional texts um, seem to start in this similar way. And to say that it was expounded by Venerable Manjushri means that Lama Tsongkhapa, the, the author, he was in connection with Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom, and got these teachings directly from him and was inspired by him when he wrote them. So there's a deep connection with the wisdom side of the path related to this practice. And then there's the first line, which is the expression of homage, which is all about the guru. And it says, I bow down to my perfect gurus. His Eminence Chudin Rinpoche explains, with this line, homage is expressed for the gurus. Although there are many objects towards which we express homage or respect, such as the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, here respect is offered to the gurus. Why is this? Since the guru is like the representative of all Buddhas, many, any expression of homage towards the guru becomes an expression of homage toward all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Also, if we were to express our homage to one particular Buddha, this expression would be directed only toward that particular Buddha and would not become an expression of homage to all Buddhas. For this reason here, homage is expressed for the guru. So this is an important point all of you know this point. I think that from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective, the guru is seen as like the light shining, dispelling darkness, or like all of the Buddhas are like the sun, but the guru is like the magnifying glass that concentrates the gaze and brings it directly to you. The teachers are like more kind than all of the Buddhas because they're the ones who explain it to you directly and personally. The gurus are the mouthpiece for the Buddhas. So in the sutra perspective, we're really trying to adopt this attitude that whoever is teaching while they're teaching, we hear it as personal advice. But if they're not our teacher, if they're not our guru, we don't have to go beyond that. We don't need to kind of adopt any kind of mental gymnastics that sees that they're perfect or that they're pure or that they're amazing. We don't need to mix sutra and tantra together at the beginning. We don't need to mix in-person classes with out-of-class time socializing. We can keep it actually really tidy. And this is more useful, I think, because then you don't fall into strange relationships or strange social traps where you're trying to make someone who's an ordinary person into something that they're not. But you're still recognizing that this person has education and they have continuity of practice and that makes it useful for you to hear the Buddha through them. So if you listen for personal advice, you will hear personal advice from the Buddhas to you through this ordinary person. And it can be a very powerful way to actually make the teachings connect with you. So if you hear the teachings as like, I've heard this a million times, I already know, or I think my friends should hear this because they're really stressed out or they're really difficult or if you hear it as, this is for beginners, I'm advanced, blah, blah, blah. If you get pride involved, you don't hear the teachings correctly and they don't have the same power to transform your life. So we start all of these practices with, I pay homage to the guru, not because they need any kind of homage 
They don't need respect. They don't need devotion. They don't need offerings. They don't need any of that. You need that in order to be open. So we become receptive and open to what we respect. And if we make something special and sacred, we listen more deeply. And that makes our inner guru wake up and kind of like sit up straight and take notice. So this is kind of the background premise of why we start all of these practices with obeisance to the guru. You can, you know, evolve your understanding of the guru as the relationship with a specific person develops over time. And as your practice develops from sutra into sutra with tantra over time. But in the beginning, it's just useful to hear, I need to take this personally. All of these teachings I need to take personally, because that's the way that they'll change my life. So you guys have had lots of teachings on the guru, so you know what to do, but um, don't forget the basics as we go into the more advanced topics. Okay, so the first verse, the essential meaning of the victorious one's teachings, the path praised by all the holy victors and their children, the gateway of the fortunate ones desiring liberation, this I shall try to explain as much as I can. So this first bit, this pledge to compose, we're getting into an introduction to renunciation with the first line, the essential meaning of the victorious one's teachings. This is an introduction to the renunciation because this indicates that renunciation is the heart meaning of all the discourses of the conquerors, meaning the Buddhas. This is because when the Bhagawan, or the, you know, the foe destroyer, or the one gone beyond the Buddha, when he teaches the Dharma, all Dharma teachings are stated exclusively for the sake of freedom from samsara. All of the teachings boil down to getting out of samsara. Then you can go into a Mahayana perspective where you're going to full Buddhahood enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. But across the board, all forms of Buddhism are trying to get us out of samsara. So since they are stated exclusively for the sake of freedom from samsara, renunciation is the principal path for attaining freedom. To begin with, what is the meaning of the term renunciation? Having seen that samsara in its entirety is it has the nature of suffering, the uncontrived mind wishing to be free from samsaric existence is renunciation. Without any admiration at all for whatever glorious states might occur in samsara, we should think of them all as having the nature of suffering. So, then it will go on into going into renunciation in more depth, but this first verse is a, your introduction to those three principal aspects. So line one, renunciation, line two, bodhicitta, line three, correct view. So we'll go back to renunciation, but just to kind of get ourselves summarized, line two is the path praised by all the holy victors and their children. This line teaches bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is induced through compassion, which does not tolerate the fact that other sentient beings are tormented by suffering and through love, which wishes them to have happiness. It is the mind that contemplates attaining the state of Buddhahood in order to free sentient beings from suffering and endow them with happiness. And that thinks that when Buddhahood is attained, we will invest all of them with happiness and free them from suffering. When this mind occurs all the time, spontaneously, and without needing to consider reasoning, it is called uncontrived bodhicitta. So that's the second. The third is the gateway or ford for the fortunate ones desiring liberation. The ford refers to a road leading to a city that we wish to visit. In that sense, 
the road is the Ford entering the city. Similarly, when we need to attain freedom, the path realizing emptiness is the path leading to freedom. And since we must traverse that path because there is no other avenue, the wisdom realizing emptiness is the ford of freedom for those seeking freedom, namely the fortunate ones with merit, which is us theoretically. The Buddha said that although all appearances, excuse me, although all phenomena appear to be established from their own side, they are not established the way they appear. While this ignorance of self-grasping conceives them to be established the way they appear, through stating that they are not established the way they appear, the ignorance of self-grasping is harmed. Once the ignorance of self-grasping is exhausted through being harmed, we turn away from samsara. In the opposite case, once the ignorance of self-grasping is supported by conceiving phenomena to exist the way they appear, we enter into samsara, or samsara is perpetuated. This I shall try to explain as much as I can, this last line. This is the actual pledge to compose through revealing the meaning of the text in brief. Venerable Manjushri imparted this advice to J. Rinpoche, Lama Tsongkhapa, acting as his spiritual guide. J. Rinpoche does not indicate any pride by saying, I know these things, I am a scholar. Instead, he states, although I do not know how things really exist, I will explain these matters according to the best of my understanding by saying this I shall try to explain as much as I can. So this is the kind of attitude that we want to adopt when we're listening and when we're explaining that we have a really deep confidence in our Buddha nature and a really deep connection with our objects of refuge while at the same time not having any pride. Because as soon as you have pride that thinks, I need to know the answers, I'm the expert, I'm going to dominate this conversation, I have something to prove. As soon as you kind of adopt that attitude, you're no longer able to hear new wisdom or upgraded wisdom. And yet you still have something to offer. So it's not like Jay Rinpoche, Lama Tsongkhapa says, oh, because I don't have a perfect realization because I'm not a Buddha, I have nothing to say. You know, I have to be perfect in order to speak up. He doesn't say that. He says, despite the fact that I'm not perfect, I'm still going to try to explain this. And so it's that really delicate line between what is confidence and what is pride. Confidence is so useful because it really has faith in yourself and your ability to transform and hear wisdom. Pride says, I have to already know everything and I'm a little bit superior in looking down. And the more pride you have, the more isolated you feel. You're all alone at the top. And then you have to maintain that all the time and it's exhausting. So if the very author of this teaching is saying, I don't know everything, but I'll explain as best as I can, then we as the students even more so, if that makes sense. So that's just roughing out the three principal aspects of the path. And then as the Saturdays go on, then you'll flesh them out and flesh them out and go more and more deeply with them. Today, let's now focus specifically on renunciation. So when you hear the word renunciation in English, think determination to be free from samsara. Think intention to get out of suffering. Don't hear, I have to give up pleasure. Yeah, when you hear samsara, you think that's suffering. When you hear renunciation, freedom from suffering, freedom from samsara. The word renunciation always has that vibe of, I have to get rid of my pleasure. I'm not allowed to have any fun if I'm a Buddhist. You know, even though we know better, there's still a little bit of that atmosphere. So make sure that you always remember, renunciation is the highest form of self-compassion. 
Yeah, real self-compassion, real self-care is to stop hurting yourself, to stop creating suffering and the causes of suffering for yourself, which means a deep dive into what are the causes of suffering. Okay, and so we'll do a meditation on this after you've had time to discuss, but just really, you know, reinforce your understanding of what is renunciation. We're giving up pain. <laughs> We're giving up pain and the causes of pain. And why it's difficult to understand is that temporary happiness feels like something to pursue. It really seems like a good idea to chase. And we forget again and again how unsatisfactory living in a chasing, hungry way is. And we're not stupid. You know, if, if it didn't work at all, we wouldn't keep doing it. But it works just a little and temporarily, and it gives us intermittent reinforcement. Sometimes if I eat this cake, it makes me happy. Sometimes I eat this cake, it makes me sick. But it does sometimes seem to make me happy. So I'll keep trying. Maybe this will be the good time. You know, sometimes talking to this friend is enjoyable. Sometimes it's suffering. I'll just assume that there's still a chance for happiness from the talking and keep doing it. And every time we approach life in this way, we disempower ourselves because we forgot that the cause of happiness was our own mind. And we gave all the power to the external world. So renunciation is freeing yourself from those really problematic patterns of mind. So then there's really beautiful verses about this in the text. And I'll go through them just briefly and then there'll be time for you guys to talk about it. So verse two says, those who are not attached to the pleasures of circling samsara, who strive to make freedom and endowments meaningful, who entrust themselves to the path pleasing the victorious ones, meaning the Buddhas. You fortunate ones, listen with a calm mind. So without wasting and rendering meaningless the attainment of a human existence that supports the eight types of leisure and 10 endowments, these disciples render it meaningful. In order to make it meaningful, those who are endowed with the quality of confidence in the path pleasing the conquerors, meaning the three principal aspects of the path of the conquerors, are encouraged to listen with a very clear mind. So those leisures and endowments, this is the teaching on perfect human rebirth that you find in the Lam Rim tradition. And we don't have to go through each one of these specifically, but on one side you see the eight, so there are four conditions for a human life that make it nearly impossible to practice dharma and four non-human states, which either have too much suffering or too much pleasure to have the mental space to engage with practice. So to have a perfect human rebirth, you're free from that list of eight. And then the 10 opportunities are framed in terms of what one has rather than what one is free from. So five are related to our own conditions, five are external conditions. So the summary of all this list is basically, you have time and space and ability to practice whatever you want to practice. And we take it for granted. We don't realize that being a human is rare, having intelligence is rare, having resources is rare, and wanting to pursue a spiritual path is rare. All of those things don't happen for everyone. The conditions don't come together. And for us, they don't always come together. So we're kind of looking at this as an exercise in gratitude to motivate us to live life to the fullest in the most meaningful way by pursuing the spiritual path. So, the purpose of generating renunciation, verse three, without the complete intention, definitely to be free from circling, there is no way to pacify attachment, seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. Also, 
by craving for cyclic existence, embodied beings are continuously bound. Therefore, at the very beginning, seek renunciation. So it's saying that the reason we need renunciation is that without it, you'll have no willpower to get out of your negative patterns. If you don't see how the appearances of this life and the appearances of future lives are all kind of ego obsessed and temporary and not useful, if we don't see that, we're never gonna break the spell and we're never gonna pursue actually getting ourselves out of this mess. And so freedom and endowments are difficult to find and life has no time to spare. By gaining familiarity with this, attraction to the appearances of this life is reversed. So we're looking at the meaningfulness of leisure and fortune. Leisure means having the time to accomplish the excellent doctrine of the Buddha. Fortune means having all the inner and outer conditions conducive to realizing it. The difficulty in finding it is because most beings, including humans, for the most part, engage in the 10 non-virtuous actions, which are obstacles to obtaining leisure and fortune. In particular, in order to obtain all aspects of life support of complete leisure and fortune, one needs the basis of complete action of ethics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So ethics is key, but it's not prioritized in such a way for all human beings that they can create more human rebirths back to back to back. You know, we get if we get away with it, we think that it doesn't have an impact on our future life or on the rest of this life. If we do something unethical that's like a victimless crime or doesn't seem to hurt anyone specifically, or it's something we get away with and no one notices, we don't realize the effect that has on our mind stream in terms of perpetuating our habit of self-obsession and me first, me first. So by thinking over and over again, that actions and their effects are unbetraying and repeatedly contemplating the miseries of cyclic existence, attraction to the appearances of future lives is reversed. So here it's saying, if we want renunciation, the way to do that is to think about karma and to think about the suffering of cyclic existence. Those two things. So that's what, um, you guys will spend some time discussing is really to say, okay, if I want to break a bad habit, I know that just telling myself that is not enough. You know, if you want to, I don't know if you gave up smoking or you gave up this, or you gave up that just saying, don't do it bad. Don't do it bad. Not useful. Right. You had to go back a few steps to what do I think this is doing for me? Why do I keep doing it? And then you notice the short-sightedness of, it does have a temporary pleasure, but it has a long-term negative effect. You know, take, take smoking, for example, which, you know, is not the end of the world and is pretty ethically neutral and don't be mean to people who smoke and probably all of us smoked at one point. But, you know, like take that as an example where the short-term benefit is relaxation, some blissful experience, chance to take a break, you know, there's lots of benefits to smoking in the immediate, you know, there are, there are immediate benefits, but the long-term effect is something that we pretend not to see because we want immediate gratification. Take that very benign, not big deal example to your habit of anger and your habit of attachment. You know, anger can be very satisfying in the moment when you express it. I told them, I showed them, or attachment, getting what it wants. You feel so kind of fulfilled and nourished and pleasurable. But when your drives are those two sides of things, attachment and aversion, it creates a habit of discontent. It means that your mind is always pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling. And you're going back and forth between too much and not enough, and you're never satisfied. And so 
to develop renunciation, you take a few steps back and you think, because of not having a long view of my own self and my impact on society and people around me, I do things that are not totally ethical, which plants the seed for suffering in my future. Yeah. And that suffering in my future is the opposite of what I want. But whenever I do suffer, I generate more habits to try and soothe myself, which actually create more causes for suffering. So it's like we do the opposite of what's going to give us happiness. Trying to get happiness, we get suffering. So if instead we can have that longer view that says, I can actually use a little bit of suffering in a good way, with some reframing, with some mindfulness and centeredness, and the suffering will finish and lead to happiness. But if I'm always at war with the present moment and trying to make it into something it really can't be in a stable way, if I'm trying to manipulate people and manipulate things to behave in the way I want them to, then I'm actually creating the opposite of what I want. I'm creating more suffering. So generating renunciation really depends on looking at karma and looking at suffering. It also relies on valuing your human life and wanting to make it meaningful rather than just a life spent with moving from entertainment project to entertainment project. You know, it's like, it's not a terrible, terrible thing to waste your whole life, but it is a little bit terrible if you know better and you can do more. You know, it, it actually becomes really embarrassing to waste a life with so many opportunities that we have right now. So the perfect human rebirth side of looking at renunciation is to get you out of depression. It's to make you have kind of this feeling of wealth and abundance so much that you're like spilling over and want to share everything that you have because you feel so rich with the amazing opportunities you have right now. And you have this perfect balance of a life that has had some real struggles. And so you're motivated to not want more of that. You have empathy for others who have that. At the same time, you have health and independence and resources to pursue whatever you want to pursue. But you're not like in the 1% billionaire status where you're drunk with pleasure and so separated from the sufferings of regular people that you just ignore them. You know, it would be really unfortunate if we were in a godlike realm or if we were in the 1% billionaire realm in terms of our spiritual practice, because we would need to have such a strong mind to stay altruistic. But we're close enough to suffering, to remember suffering and to be able to see suffering and want to help alleviate suffering for ourselves and others. So perfect human rebirth, you know, you're just looking at, yep, no, this is a good balance I have. Enough suffering and enough happiness. I have to use it for more than just being an animal. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, turn it over to you guys to talk amongst yourselves and I'll come back after the break and I think the useful thing to do is um, if Tal if you could facilitate are you going to facilitate yeah she said yes she said yes okay um, and basically it's just to keep you from uh, talking over the top of each other too much so <laughs> So you can all take turns facilitating, but what I want you to discuss is how do you apply renunciation? Why do you apply renunciation? And it doesn't have to be perfect Buddhist answers. I want you to really look deeply within yourself. 